fellow redeemed. We consider the fifth petition of the Lord's Prayer. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. I said a few weeks ago that perhaps the most difficult prayer to pray, the most difficult petition to pray in the Lord's Prayer, comes rather early in the Lord's Prayer. When we pray, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And that prayer seems to be the most difficult for many people because it requires a bowing of the head and a submitting my will to God's will. Saying that my desires, my wants, my needs, my preferences are secondary to what God has said in his word. Thy will be done, we pray, the most difficult petition in the Lord's Prayer, but then we get to today's. And today's petition is not the most difficult to pray, but it's certainly the most terrifying. Because in this petition, in this terrifying petition, we have a sharp reminder from our Savior that his law still applies. We understand that part, right? That when we go through page 26 or page 15 or whatever is printed in the bulletin, that the worship service starts with, I confess to you, Lord, that I have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, and that I, I deserve your punishment both here and in eternity. And so for the sake of my Lord Jesus Christ, I pray, have mercy on me, a sinner. That's a statement acknowledging God's law. God's law which, which always condemns. God's law which always accuses. God's law, which isn't just some, some rote routine to read through, but it applies to our lives. And yes, we, we see God's law most operative, perhaps, when our will collides with the will of God. And so we come into the presence of God, and we confess our sins. Lord, I know that I'm not bringing anything of my own merit here to you today. I know that I can't stand before you on the basis of my own deeds, my own works, because I would be clothed in filthy clothes. But Lord, for the sake of your Son, forgive me. That beginning to the worship service, a brief review of, of law and gospel, of the conditions upon which you and I come into the presence of God, and the pastor has the privilege of announcing what Christ has won for you and for me and for every single person on this earth, announcing that for the sake of our risen Lord Jesus, your sin is forgiven. But then we get to the Lord's Prayer, this most terrifying of petitions, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Do we realize what we're praying there? Because it's terrifying. I'll turn it around. Lord, as I'm standing here in your presence today, as I'm standing here and bowing my head, as I'm hearing what you say in your word and responding to you in prayer, Lord, your eyes see everything. Now look into my heart. And if you find the smallest shred of a grudge, if you find the smallest little hint of unforgiveness in my heart, Lord, then take your forgiveness away from me. Terrifying. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lord, as I measure out forgiveness to others, use that same measurement to me. And all of a sudden, all of a sudden, perhaps that, uh, that statement of God's law that we read through and that you might know by heart even, that you don't even have to look at your hymnal at the beginning of the worship service, that statement that I confess to you that I am by nature sinful, all of a sudden we get to the fifth petition, forgive, us my, forgive me my sins in the same way that I forgive those who sin against me. That law of God fits right here. It makes me squirm. Because I know what kind of grudges that I've held on to. And maybe you're the same way. I know the, the ideas 
and the unwillingness to forgive. I know the, even the, the, the simple passive way that a pastor like myself would say, you know, somebody apologizes to me and I say, I shrug it off and say, nah, not a big deal. Because that's what we do in our culture, right? Not a big deal, don't worry about it. When somebody offends me or when somebody hurts me, shrug it off, not a big deal. But pastorally, pastorally I know, and you know, that as a Christian you have the right, the ability, the responsibility to tell somebody that they are forgiven. That even if it wasn't a big deal, you can say, I forgive you. But if I shrug it off, and I say, not a big deal, they go on their way thinking it wasn't a big deal. And my sinful heart says, it's a big deal in here. That grudge begins to take root. And the unity that God wants to build is frustrated when people, when people don't let God's law do its work. And when people hold back from declaring the gospel truth of forgiveness. Consider for yourself. You might say to yourself, but Pastor Hagen, you, you don't know me that well. You don't know my life. You don't know what I've been through. You don't know what I've had to experience. And you don't know the kind of trauma and the, the heartache that others have placed on me. You don't know how difficult it is to forgive somebody. And I, I see what you're saying here. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who sin against us. That's terrifying, but that's impossible. Because if my forgiveness is linked to my forgiving, then I'm lost. And you might even go a step further and say, Pastor Hagen, I'm, I'm lost, and it's not really my fault, at least to that same extent, because I've had to deal with a lot. I've had to deal with situations, and I carry the, the guilt or the baggage, and I carry the, the wondering and the waiting and the frustration of knowing that somebody else hurt me. And maybe, maybe you've, you've lost the ability to speak to that person, whether they've, they've moved away or even passed away. And you say to yourself, Pastor, how can anybody be saved? How can I be saved? If my forgiveness is linked to my forgiving, then I'm totally lost and I should just get out and enjoy the rest of my 30 or 40 years that I've got. You notice the rest of the readings today really talked about how God does the impossible. To people who, who see it as impossible to forgive somebody else. To people who see and examine their own hearts and recognize that my heart isn't usually, you know, not always, overflowing with forgiveness and, and glad, happy feelings toward others, to people who wonder, is it possible to forgive that person for what they did? Jesus talks to you today and says that he does the impossible. He does the impossible when, when the Midianites swept in and covered the land of Palestine like locusts. And this army of 300, 400,000 is, is jam-packed into this valley. And Gideon shows up with an army of 32,000, and God says that's, you know, 31,700 too many. <laughs> we have a God who does the impossible. And he doesn't do that by giving us another law, by saying, here's what you should do, here's the list of principles, here's the checklist to follow, just work on that checklist and change your attitude this week. He does the impossible by doing the impossible. Not just by, by working through Gideon and his group of 300 ragtag militants. Not just by, by driving out the Midianites and God slaughtering them, but by winning an even greater battle. The battle against our own sinful hearts. God did the impossible by becoming human. You realize that, right? You realize that. That this Jesus Christ that we talk about so much, whose, whose picture is behind me, whose crucifix is above me here, this Jesus that we talk about so much is from eternity. He has no beginning and no end. He is, he is one person of our triune God. God is, you know, he's one 
He's three, one God, three persons, three persons, one God, that we'll talk about in the Nicene Creed. This person of the Trinity did the impossible. Where God, who is infinite, took up residence within the finite confines, where the one through whom all things were made took up residence in, the, in one creature that he had made, and not that she was perfect, but that's the impossible thing that God did by becoming human, just as human as you or I. So that just as we might be celebrating a birthday today, like, uh, like Mr. Skreptok, just as we might be celebrating a birthday today, so also Jesus. You could say he is eternally God with all authority, all power in heaven and on earth. And at the same time, the exact same time, you could say he is a Jewish man descended from Abraham, Isaac, David, and, uh, and he's a little over 2,000 years old. Because God does the impossible. And God does the impossible in your life too. Because this Jesus, who rules over all things, has done the impossible for you and for me. And the impossible thing that he did was die. God can't die. But Jesus did. True God. True man. He died on the cross to win your forgiveness and mine. And so the forgiveness that we share isn't, isn't our own will. It's not an, an act of volition. It's not an act where we say, all right, finally, I've worked myself up to forgiving that person. No, <laughs> the forgiveness that we share is a forgiveness that we announce. That I know my Lord has forgiven me. He's done the impossible in forgiving me. And I cannot hold back from you that same announcement of forgiveness. So where does God's law fit into that? Because we talked about that earlier, that this is a, a strong statement of law. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Maybe we should just get a little white out and white out this part of the Lord's Prayer. Because Christians don't need the law, right? We most <laughs> certainly do. And what God gives us here is the path for thankful Christian living that you, as somebody who knows that you've been forgiven, you, as somebody who knows that your Lord took on our human flesh to give you an eternity with him, you know the forgiveness that our Lord has won for you, and he has brought us together into this, this Christian community. And as people who are still sinful people, who hold grudges, who have different ideas and, and wishes and desires, different personalities that sometimes you know, rub shoulders the wrong way, there's ample opportunity to offend somebody else or to harm somebody else with our words or with our actions. And so we pray, Lord, teach me to forgive others as you have forgiven me. Lord, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lord, remind me, remind me that the fact that you took on human flesh and you still retain, have that human flesh today, that you've done the impossible, Jesus. That's a tremendous reminder and an incredible power to be able to forgive somebody else. And so God says, if, this is, if you're just looking for a way how to praise God with your life, if you're looking for how do you praise God, just look at this petition right here. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lord, give me the understanding of your gospel. Give me the understanding of your forgiveness so that, so that I can share that, that I can announce that to somebody else that I know. Lord, give me that understanding of what you've done for me so that we, together, can share that same announcement of what God has done for somebody else. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. You may have noticed, maybe not, <laughs> I'm not usually too much of a, of a country music fan. Picked it up a little bit in Minnesota and, um, and maybe on YouTube when something just, you know, they send you a new video music to listen to every now and then. But there's this one guy, that one song that always catches me. And it's by Alan Jackson. He's got, you know, two fairly decent songs, and um, I don't know what else he sings, or if, even if he's still alive. My apologies to all the country music fans out here. 
but there's one song that um, that came up again this last week, and it goes kind of like this. Where were you when the world stopped turning that September day? And as he kind of plunks through on his guitar, he, he paints these, these beautiful little vignettes, these little pictures of, of life across our country when all of a sudden terrorism struck and changed life as we know it. And you think of that. You know, we just passed that up this last week again. It's been 18 years. And you think of that, and then we get to forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And you think of the, the patriotism, you think of the ongoing war on terror for the last 18 years, and that has its place because one of the roles of government is to provide peace and security for their people. But as a Christian, and as a pastor, where has your heart been this last week? And when it comes around again next year, and when that song hits the, ra- the radio waves or comes up in Spotify, where were you when the world stopped turning that September day? Perhaps that's a good application. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. That we commit into the hands of the government that God has given us. We commit into their hands the justice. But our responsibility is the forgiveness. Where we pray, even even as our soldiers go overseas, we pray, Lord, change their hearts. Change their hearts that, that one day, that one day we may see some of those people in heaven with us. Because maybe that gets us back to Jesus' main point in this petition. Is he wants to teach us as we work together, as we live together, as we perhaps offend one another or hurt each other's feelings, as we are harmed by those who hate us, Jesus wants us to understand how utterly impossible it was for God to win forgiveness for you and for me. And that the forgiveness we reflect isn't so much related to the attitude of our heart, but the attitude of our God, who gave everything to win your forgiveness and mine. And so if you were to say, but Pastor, that sounds impossible, I'd say exactly. And we have a God who did the impossible by becoming a human and dying and rising (laughs) to win forgiveness for all people. A forgiveness that is given to you through word and sacrament. A forgiveness that is entrusted into your hands for you and me to share. And so there's every reason to pray. Lord, teach me to forgive others as you have forgiven me. Amen.